Okay, so college algebra review for Mac 1105, test two. So you got 10 questions to get through on this. Covers everything from 3.1 through 3.5. Okay, so our first question that's up to bat. And again, it likes to go in order of everything too. So the way that we learned it in class, the way that it's coming at you. So the first thing is in 3.1, you learned about finding domain. Other cool thing about this test is that for our college algebra classes that are doing it through my math lab and testing through my math lab, all the answers are going to be in multiple choice form. So you don't have to do any fill in the blank this time on this exam. So how do we find the domain for a function like this? You bet. Take the denominator, set it equal to zero, because this is a rational function. Remember, when it comes to domains, your function's domain is always all reals, unless you're rational, which is what we have here, and or you're a radical, which we don't have any radicals, so we don't worry about that. Okay? But if it was a radical, remember that if there was a radical, whatever the polynomial under here was, you take that polynomial, and you set it greater than or equal to zero to solve. Okay? But we don't have to worry about that. We have a rational, which is just what you said, Lorraine. Take the denominator, set it equal to zero, and we need to solve. Now, how do we start to solve this? Yeah, we got to do some factoring. So both of these had an x in common, so you're correct with that. Let's pull out a GCF of an x which will leave us with what? x squared minus 25. And you could take this one of two directions now if you wanted to. You could continue to factor, or you could take and set these equal to 0 for each one of them. I like to continue to factoring because I like to review factoring with you guys. But again, there is nothing wrong with taking each one of these and taking them and setting them equal to zero. Be careful with this guy, because when you square root both sides, what has to happen with your answer? You'll have what in front of your answer? Plus or minus, exactly. So be careful of that. But if you go ahead and factor this, you don't have to worry about the plus and the minus information because it will just fall out within the answers. So this guy, remember, this is just a difference of squares. So that will factor into what? x plus 5, x minus 5. Good. And so now all you do is just take all these, set them equal to 0, and that flushes out some of the information for our, denomin or for our domain. So we have x equal to 0 which there's one of our answers. We got x plus 5 equal to 0, which gives us what for x? You got it. So there's another piece of our domain that we care about. And we got x minus 5 equal to 0, which tells us that x is equal to 5. Now, if you kind of look at your answers, there's only one of these that has anything to do with these numbers. And that's answer B. And that is our domain. Because remember, these numbers, the reason why we set the denominator equal to 0 is because we need to figure out what numbers create that 0 there, which is bad, because we can't divide by 0. And that's why you see in this domain right here, it's written out in set notation that we have x not equal to these numbers because these are the bad numbers. OK? If it asks for interval notation, remember that these are all the numbers that we throw out. We invite everybody else. So interval notation for this would actually looks a little longer. But you start at negative infinity, and we go up to our lowest number, which is negative 5. And then we jump over it. We pick back up at negative 5 and go up to 0. And then we jump over it. And then we pick up from 0, we go up to 5. And then we jump over that number, and we go from 5 to infinity. So if they wrote out interval notation, it would look like that. Because we invite every number 
but the negative 5, because we jumped over it, the 0, because we jumped over it, and the 5, because we jumped over it. So that's what interval notation looks like. So always good to review both. All right, so that's the first question. Second question, again from 3, 1. No. Yes. Yeah, this is 3, 1 still. Okay. Forgetting what I was doing. So in 3, 1, remember that you were working on adding functions, subtracting functions, multiplying functions, dividing functions, and getting new ones. So right here, we're just going to ask about one of those operations. We want to know what is f times g. And then in the end, we want to talk about its domain again. So domain keeps popping up. That's important for us. So we want to take f times g. So when we did this in class, we take this function times that function, which is really just doing what? What do we have to do to multiply those? That's what it looks like when we plug in. FOIL, there you go. Yeah, when you're multiplying functions, the basic idea is FOIL. First, outer, inner, last. So we FOIL. So what is 2x and 8x? 16x squared, because x times x is x squared. Outside, yep. Careful. Minus 4x, good, because a positive times a negative is negative, all right? Enter, minus 32x, and last, plus 8. And then what do we do now? Combine like terms, and that's your two middle guys. So we end up with 16x squared. No. This is a negative 4. This is a negative th 32. You just put them together. Negative 36x plus 8. So if we go up here, really there's only one answer that has that. You don't even really have to know what the domain of this is, although it's pretty easy to look at the domain because we just talked about this. Does this look like a rational? Does this look like a fraction? No. Does it have a radical in it? So the domain is always negative infinity to infinity, or in other words, all reals. So the only answer that had that information was right here. Didn't even have to talk about the domain, but again, I like to talk about the domain. Always good to review it. So B was the only one that actually had the correct information when multiplying. Yay, moving on. Question three. So this is definitely coming from uh, 3, 2, where we're going to look at the graph and we're going to get a lot of information from it, which is what we did in 3, 2. So over here, these are all the answers that they're looking for. Okay, we just got to know which one of these is correct for this graph. So the first thing that it's asking us is it wants to know whether or not the graph is a function. How do we tell if we have functions from a graph? We had a test. What's that test called? Nope. Oh, the line. Yeah, the line straight down test. What are these lines called? The ones that run up and down? Nope. What kind of line? Oh, vertical. vertical line. Yeah, vertical line test. That's right. So remember the vertical line test. You draw on a lot of vertical lines, and as long as you only hit the graph once, you're a function. So first question says, is this a function? Well, if I draw on all these vertical lines, how many times am I hitting my graph? But how many times? No, each line. How many times does I hit it? One. So this is a function. I'm only hitting my graph once. It's right there, even though it doesn't really look like it. I hit it once. I hit it once. I hit it once. OK? So this is a function. So right away, you can. You cannot worry about D, because D says it's not a function. So that answer's out now. We have a function. 
So our answer is either B, C, or A. So now, question number two says, if it is, find the domain and the range. Okay? And they give us domain and range in uh, set notation, which is fine. Okay? So let's take a look at this. So remember, domain is all about the x values. So as we work along the x-axis, is there anywhere where my graph does not exist? Where? You're looking along the x. So at negative 3, well, negative 3, my graph is right there. If I was standing there, the graph would impale me. So our graph is at negative 3. Is there anywhere where it's not? Yeah. Where? To the, left. to the left of that. So at negative 4? Yeah. But my graph is right here. Oh. There's negative 4 or whatever it is. Oh, so, then that'll keep going. so this will keep going? Yeah. Absolutely. It's kind of a bad graph. There should be arrows on this, and that's okay. Because our graph, this graph does keep going, and this graph keeps going down and out. This graph will keep going down and out. It looks like it's going to shoot straight down, but it really is still moving out. I mean, it will go into the Earth's core. It will go out on the other side of the Earth, at you know Australia, Japan, wherever it's going through, China. Beware the um, coronavirus, all that good stuff. So this thing will go through and keep going down. So are there any bad x values? Is there anywhere where my graph doesn't exist? No. Our graph exists everywhere for x values. So in other words, if I had an equation here, if I had the function, I can take any number of x and I can plug it in and I will get a y value out every time. All right, so that means that our domain is what? All reals. So A is still valid. You can throw out B because right here it says the domain is restricted. C is still valid because it says all real numbers there. All right, good. So right now we got a 50-50 shot. So let's look at the range. Well, if you look at both of these, both of them already have the same range. So the range ain't going to do it for us. So you don't have to worry about finding the range because both of these answers have the same range. This is like working smarter, not harder. But when we talk about the range, it is true. that When we think about range, it's all about our y values. That's the highest my y value will go. So we like everybody below the negative or the positive 4, which is why you see this. Because when we did this interval style, it would look like this. And interval style, negative infinity to 4 is the same as writing y less than or equal to 4. Because of a bracket, we're equal to. And it starts at 4, and it goes on down to the less than. But again, that doesn't help us with A or C. They're both the same. So then now we've got to look at some other information. Almost symmetry. We need to look at intercepts. So let's take a look at this picture. Do I have x-intercepts? What are they? Negative 3, comma 0. And 1 comma 0. So let's see if which answer has these guys. So if I look up at A, I don't see the negative 3, 0. But if I look down at C, oh, there's negative 3, 0. Hey, there's my 1, 0. So now, based off of that information, I know the answer has to be C. Because if you look at the rest of it, it makes sense. Our y-intercept is actually right there. That's at 0, 3, which is, oh, look, right there. And then last but not least, do I have symmetry? That's the last question. So you look at x-axis. If I take this point up here and flip it over here, does that mean it's the same picture? No, because your picture will look like this. If I flip, that's what it looks like. And that's not the same picture. If I flip over the y-axis, will it look the same? No, because if I flip over the y-axis, it looks like this. And that's not the same picture. 
And then the other one is if I turn it 180 degrees, will it look the same picture? Will it look like the same picture? And the answer again is no, because it will actually be right here, 180 degrees. So the answer all around is no, none. And if you looked at A and looked at C, both of them had that symmetry. So when it came down to A and C, it was all about the intercepts. So absolutely, no symmetry on that. Perfect. OK? So again, it's all just about analyzing that graph and finding out stuff that you know. All right. So there's number three. Number four. So this wants to know the graph of a function is given, okay? And then we've got this interval. And so this interval takes place from negative 1 to 1. Remember that this interval is all about x values. So it's asking you from here to here, what is the graph doing? Is it increasing, constant, or decreasing? Well, all you got to do is put your finger on this point right over here on the left, and what is your pin doing? It's going down, so that means it is decreasing. If your pin moved up, it would be increasing. If your pin just moved horizontally, that's what we call constant. So that's all at once. Yep, so you look at that interval, you put your pin on your graph, and you see what happens between those two values. Does your pin go down? Does your pin go up? Does your pen just move straight across horizontally? And then answer. Moving on, number five. So over here, it wants to know, are there any local maximums? And then what are the local maxima? Remember from class we talked about this? When it asks you um, if, there are, if you are finding the numbers, what are you doing? Come on now about a local maxima, this is all about what are the x values. When it says what are the local maxima, that's all about the y value. OK? Remember when we talked in class that there is a very, very specific definition for this. It's mathematical, very mathematical in nature. It, it's a giant mess. And then I kind of broke it down and made it a little bit easier to understand. When we talked about local maxima, it meant that it was the top of a hill, the top of a curve, OK? And it cannot be endpoints. Endpoints are never local maximas, nor are they local minimums. So a local max is the top of a curve. A local minimum was the bottom of the curve, OK? And endpoints are not included in this. So. The question they want to know is, are there any tops of a curve that we can talk about that are not an endpoint? There is. And that's this dot that's right there. That is the top of our curve. That is a local maximum. So first off, to answer the first question, says, what is that x value? Zero. That's right. You're at zero there. So that is the x value. And what is the y value up there? It is at 1. So we just need an answer that shows that. So as we look through it, it says A, F has a local maximum at x equals 0. Well, that's right. And the local maximum is 1. That's it, right there. Has to be A. Because if you look at the rest of them, this one says the local maximum is at negative pi and pi. That's not true. Those are actually local minimums. OK? And their local minimum would actually be negative 1 on that. It's not a maximum at all. Uh, if you look at f, it says local maximum at negative pi and pi. It doesn't even answer the second question, which is weird. It should have another answer onto it. Let me consult mine real quick and get the rest of that piece right there. Oh, I see what happened. So this answer for C is actually F has a local maximum at, whoa, doing weird things. I mean, local maximum at negative pi. It wasn't supposed to be in that. And then it says 
the local maximum is 1. That's actually the ending of that guy. But again, we already talked about negative pi. Okay? So that one gets thrown out. And then D has no local maximum. Well, we know that's not true because we named one. So there you go. Again, local maximums and minimums, they are the top of a curve, the bottom of a curve, but not endpoints. All right. So this goes back to what we talked about in module one, even, odd, and neither. Even and odd are just new terminology for symmetry. Even meant that we had y-axis symmetry. Odd meant that we had origin symmetry. We don't worry about x-axis, OK? So all you have to do is test for this. And you are going to be one of these three. You cannot be a mixture of it. And you cannot be more than one, OK? You are either even, odd, or neither as a function. You are not more than one. So when we look at this, how do we test y-axis symmetry? We plug in what? Not zero. But I like that you're talking about x. Plug in a negative x, because we're testing symmetry. When you plug in zero for x, that means you're looking for a y-intercept. Yeah, plug in a negative x to test y-axis. So we're going to do that. Five. And any time I plug in a negative x to a power, I put it in parentheses. Minus parenthesis negative x squared. All right. So a negative x to the power of 4 will become a what? x to the? No. x to the power of 4. Yeah. Anytime you take a negative number and raise it to an even power, it comes out positive. So this just becomes 5x to the fourth. So over here, I'm taking a negative x, and I'm squaring it. So what do I get? x squared. So does this equation, 5x to the fourth minus x squared, look like our original function? It does. So that means we have y-axis, which means that we are even. And you stop. You're done. Because you're even, you don't need to worry about everybody else. But let's say we weren't even. Let's go ahead and do the origin real quick. To test origin, we plug into what? We plug into both of them, and a negative x and a negative y. Yeah. So some of you will be like, no, I don't see the negative. I don't see a y value up here. Remember that f of x is the same as saying y equals. So that is your y value. So negative y equals 5, negative x to the fourth, minus negative x squared. And what's cool about this that we couldn't do before, you already know what happens to this side. You can just steal it from before. We already know that this whole side that I circle becomes 5x to the fourth, minus x squared. Now, the only thing you have to remember is, well, what do we do with this negative y? Because I want the y to be positive. So what are we going to do? Yeah, you can multiply both sides by a negative 1, and that will take care of it. Or divide by a negative 1. In other words, basically all that's going to happen to turn this positive is we're just going to switch everybody's signs. So the positive 5 becomes a negative 5x to the fourth. The negative x squared becomes a positive x squared. And as you can see, does this equation, negative 5x to the fourth plus x squared, match the original? Hence why it was not odd. OK, and you can't be neither since we already marked even. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But that's it. That's how you do even, odd, and neither. You're just testing for symmetry. You want to test even. Check it for y-axis. You want to test odd, look for the origin. If it's not one of those two, it's neither. All right, seven. 
So I want you to find the average rate of change. Average rate of change is just another name for slope. They want you to find the slope. So what is our formula for slope? Okay, y1 minus y2. Yeah, and this is Mr. Armstrong's formula that he likes to run. Okay, but if we are, but if we are doing the full mathematical, it would actually be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Both are the same. Okay, now they're just going to make you work for this. That's all they're going to do. So they want to know what is the slope from 2 to 7. These are x values. So if I want to know their y values, what do I do? Plug in. So you're finding the two points first. You're going to figure out what 2 comma what. And then we're going to do 7 comma what. And then once we know those two points, we can run the slope formula. So let's plug in. So we're going to take 2 and we're going to square it. And then we're going to take 9 times the 2. So what's 2 squared? 4. four. What's 9 times 2? And 4 plus 18? So one of our points is 2 comma 22. So the next one, we do the same thing, but instead of 2, this time we put in 7. So what is 7 squared? And what's 9 times 7? 63. And what do I get when I take 49 plus 63? 112. Now that you have your two points, we can run the slope formula. That's all it is. So since this was our first point, we can call this x1, y1. Since this is the second point, you can call this x2, y2. And now you know who to plug where. So do you want to do y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2, or do you want to do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1? Whatever's your favorite. You tell me. All right. So y2 is what? 112 minus what's y1? 22 divided by what's x2? No. 7 minus. There you go. All right, so what is 112 minus 22? Me either. That's what I was asking. Actually, I do know. I'm just going to make you work for it. Uh-huh. Nope, close. 90. There you go. So 90 divided by what's 7 minus 2? 5. And we always reduce our fractions. What is 90 over 5? Eighteen. There you go. So the answer is B. If you would have done the y1 minus the y2 divided by the x1 minus the x2, both of these numbers would have come out negative. And a negative over a negative is a positive. So, yep. So all that question is, number seven is just slope. What's the slope between these two numbers? And you got to find the points first and then run your formula. Okay, this guy, a lot of fun. It's what we call a piecewise function. So a piecewise function, again, remember from class, it, it means that it's made up of two or more functions, and we're taking pieces of them. So they want you to graph this. So when you're graphing, as I told you in class, I want you to do, the first thing I want you to take a look at is what's going on at the restriction. And these are your restrictions right here. So 
our number that we're focusing in on is 1. I want to know what's going on at both of these functions at 1, when x is 1. So we're going to look at the first function, this f of x equal to x minus 2. And I want to know, what is f of 1? You're plugging in 1, so that will give you 1 minus 2, which gives us what? Negative 1. Okay? So that means at the point 1, we'll be at negative 1. Now, because of the restriction, the restriction said that x is less than 1. Does that mean, do I like this point? Do I like it when x is 1? Look carefully at the restriction. Do I like it when x is 1? No, because we are not equal to here. So that means at this point, 1 comma negative 1, we have an open circle. OK? So if we come up here and look, so if we look at a, there's 1 negative 1. 1, negative 1. Is that an open circle? So far, that's a good graph for us. If we look at 12, well, we don't even have 1, negative 1. So that's out. Looking at B, oh, we don't even have 1, negative 1 there either. Or this guy, it's close to it, but it's not open. And then if we look at D, that's the same situation. Oh, what's the answer? It's got to be A. But let's talk about the rest of it, because it's important to understand what's going on. So if we look at the second function, the second function is f of x equal to 3. So again, I want to know what's going on at the point 1. So f of 1 is equal to 3. What does that mean for us? Do we have to do any solving, like what we had to do earlier? No. So you know that you have the point 1, 3. OK? Now, our restriction for this guy was x greater than or equal to 1. So in this case, do we like this point based off of this restriction? Greater than or equal to 1. x is greater than or equal to 1. So do I like the fact that, one, that x is 1 in this one? Yes. So that means this is a closed circle on my graph. And if you look at a, which we marked, sorry, that's b, 1, 3 is a closed circle. OK? So that's the first step. See what's going on at these restrictions because you'll have open and closed circles. The second step is to finish up the graphs. We want to go ahead and do the rest of the graphs. That's what the second step is. Second step, we actually want to graph. So our function f of x equals x minus 2, that's just a line. OK? And if you remember how to graph lines in here, this is just slope-intercept, where the slope is the number in front of x, which is 1 over 1. The intercept, which is the number without x, is negative 2. So remember graphing slope-intercept, you plot the b, and then you use the m, because it's directions. Because this is a positive one, it means we go up 1. Because this is a positive one down there, it means we go to the right one. So we're going to plot the b, which is negative 2. And if you go up 1 to the right one, there we are, and you just connect the dots. Or in other words, connect your intercept with the open circle, and you go down. And the reason why we keep it all to the left of this is because of the restriction. Remember that the restriction said that we want x to be less than 1 for this. In this direction from here to the left 
is where x is negative 1. That's why you only see that piece of the graph. That's why we call this piecewise, because I don't want the full graph. I just want part of it. And we want what happens from 1 to the left for that guy. Now, the second equation, stop it, was f of x equal to 3. All this is is just a horizontal line. And it's at 3. So we come up here. So again, that was just a horizontal line at 3. So we come up here. We've already got our dot there. And we draw it to the right. Because at this point for our other function, the reason why we're going to the right is because the restriction was x is greater than or equal to 1 for that one. And the only direction that is greater than or equal to 1 is to the right for that function. So that's why it's a. Because it meets the requirements of everything that we're looking at. OK? All right. No worries. 9 and 10, these last guys are all about transformations. So remember, with basic functions, their transformations look like this. y equals, or it could be f of x equals. You got a, f of b, x minus c in parentheses, plus d. And each one of these guys controlled an aspect of the function. Each one of these controlled a certain aspect of the function. So when we look up in here, from class, we broke down a lot of these over and over and over again. And so when you looked at this, this guy was a C. Now, remember in class I said, whatever you're looking at in the function, it's deceiving on what's really going on. Because C, if we remember from class, C controls moving left and right. And in class I said, whenever you look at the function, it's deceiving because it's backwards to your thinking. And the reason why it's backwards to your thinking is because in the original equation, it is a minus C. So when I look at this, this right here, it looks like C is really a positive 7. But c is not really a positive 7 up there. c is really a negative 7, which means that my graph, because this looks positive, you would think it's moving to the right. But because that's not the real c, it's really moving to the left. So we need a graph that will move left 7. So if you look at a, that's not moving to the left 7. And, and what I mean by move to the left 7, all of these graphs start at the origin or have something to do with the origin. So if I look at this, that definitely did not move to the left 7. If I look at this guy, again, that definitely did not move to the left 7. So we know that A and C are out. If we look down here, oh, that definitely moved to the left. And so did D. It definitely moved to the left. So that's where we got to look at the other piece that was given to us. So C controls left and right. This guy right here is D. D controls up and down. And we can trust D the way it looks. So D controlled up and down. So the D that we have is really a negative 3, which means that what happened to it? Uh-huh, because that's, we can trust this guy the way it is. So because D is a negative 3, that means it went down 3. So between these two graphs, B and D, which one looked like it went down 3? The graph had to go down. D? Uh-uh. Because here's the original starting place. Where did it go up from there? It went up, right? This graph right here, it went to the left 7 and then down. Okay? This graph over here went to the left 7 and then up. 
So the real answer is B, because that's the only graph that moved to the left seven and then went downward from the origin. Everything is always going to be based from that origin. All right, one more question. And again, it's transformations. And all right, so again, we're back to transformations. Remember in class, we talked about the general transformation for all these. It could be f of x equals or y equals. And it was a f of x, while f of b, parenthesis, x minus c, close out all parentheses, plus d. And f in here stood for whatever function we were dealing with. So if you look down here, they tell us the function is right there. Y is equal to the square root of X. So this equation up here, you can modify. And now that we know that function, that the function is the square root one, we have this. A, square root of B, parenthesis, X minus C, parenthesis, and then plus D is on the outside. So all they want you to do is fill in the A, B, C, and D on this. So that's what the rest of the information is going to give us right here, and you need to do it in order so that they give it to you. So it says go up six. So who controls moving up and down? Not C. D. And because this, we can trust D the way it is in the equation, what is it going to look like, a plus six or a minus six? So we're going to build this as we go along. So Y equals... We don't know what A is, we don't know what B is, we don't know what C is, so under my radical I just have X. And then because we now know what D is, we put a plus 6 on the outside. So there's our equation so far. Now, the next piece it gives us, we want to reflect over the Y axis. When we go over the Y axis, that's all about B. And because it is a reflection, what does that mean about B? it becomes negative. So when we write our equation now, all we're going to do is we're going to keep that D in there. We still don't know C, we still don't know A, so we don't worry about those, but we now know that B is negative. So it's going to look like this. Y equals square root negative X plus 6. And I don't use any parentheses here because we don't know if we have a C value to worry about or not. But if we do have a C, I will put the parentheses around the X and the C value. So if we look at the bottom here, one last piece, it says we're going to move to the right eight units. So if we move to the right eight units, who is that? Who moves us left and right? So we will have to worry about parentheses in our equation. So because I'm moving to the right 8, what does that really make the value C? Well, in the equation, it'll look like a negative 8. But our real C value is a positive 8. But exactly what you said, when we plug it into the equation, it will look negative. Now, also remember, because this is a C value, under my radical now, I have a negative outside of parentheses, because that's B. And this will look like X minus 8 in there, as we said, because it looks the opposite. And then plus 6 on the outside. And there's our equation. Now, when you look at this, it doesn't look like any of these answers up here. That's because they did away with the parentheses, because they distributed. So if we distribute through here, we end up with negative x plus 8 plus 6, which leads us to the answer of a. And that right there is test two.